So I want to thank you, Olga, for being here tonight and for presenting to our patrons. And we are very excited for tonight's presentation. Thank you, Brittany. Um, it's so wonderful to meet you all, everyone. Um, my name is Olga Cardamon. I'm a, a licensed tour guide from St. Petersburg, Russia, and an art historian. And um, I am currently in California uh, because I own a small boutique travel agency. Um, we bring a group of Americans to Russia every summer. That's what we normally do. And this year, oh, actually starting last year with COVID, um, obviously things really changed for Taurus and we weren't able to bring our regular group of Americans. And um, we really quickly switched to virtual tours. And uh, so I've been doing virtual tours of Russia for over a year now. I love doing it. Uh, you will see that I have um, um, 360 panoramic views that I will be showing you. Uh, so this is a really good way to see the major sites in St. Petersburg really quickly, right? We don't have to wait for me to walk uh, between those sites. I can show you them to you really quickly. And I'm really excited to be showing you around my hometown, uh, which is St. Petersburg. So without further ado, let me show you um, the first view of St. Petersburg, which is the um, overview of downtown St. Petersburg. Here it is. As you can see, um, at the very center of our city, we have a big river. The river is called the Neva River. And Neva is pretty much the main reason why St. Petersburg was founded to begin with. You might have heard of the name Peter the Great. And Peter the Great, um, he was a Russian czar, right? We call our kings czars. He was the Russian czar um, who ruled our country in the late 17th, early 18th century. And when Peter the Great got on the throne, he realized that we did not really have access to any sort of sea. And that meant that we couldn't really um, keep developing our trade. And he decided to do something about it. He decided to give Russia access to a sea. And he realized that there was an area in the north, which at that point belonged to Sweden. But really, historically, it was kind of going back and forth between Sweden and Russia. At some point, it was Russian territory. At some point, it was Swedish. And he realized that it was time to give Russia access to the Baltic Sea. So he started the war with Sweden. Um, the war with Sweden lasted for 20 years. And um, in the very beginning of the war, uh, so it started in 1701 and already in 1703, St. Petersburg was founded. The war only ended in 1721. But same, uh, but Russia really quickly gained access to the Baltic Sea. And if you look along the river to your left, um, over here, this is the Baltic Sea. To be precise, the part of the Baltic Sea that is called the Gulf of Finland. So this is where we have our sea access. And um, when Peter the Great um, gained that this territory for Russia, um, I'd say Sweden was not using it very efficiently because there was pretty much nothing here. Uh, there were like small tribes living here. Um, they had maybe some wooden huts. Um, and Peter the Great had this great vision that this should become the new capital of the Russian Empire, that Russia should change, that it should become a Western country. So basically on an empty territory, he decided to build the new capital. And uh, the city that basically did not exist at all in 1703, when it was founded, in 1712 already became the capital of the new empire. And as you might remember, if you're listening super carefully, I told you that the war lasted till 1721, and St. Petersburg became the capital in the very middle of the war. So technically, for almost 10 years, the capital of the new Russian Empire was technically in Sweden. But uh, luckily for us, nothing happened. Uh, uh, the Swedes did not invade the territory, did not take away our capital from us. So everything was great. And oftentimes when I bring my guests to St. Petersburg, 
um, both in real life and virtually, they say, it's amazing how straight uh, the streets are here. Um, it's because, again, Peter the Great had this great vision for the new city and everything was really meticulously planned. Um, as I said, at the center of the new city uh, would be the river that we call the Neva River. And even though St. Petersburg is over 300 years old, um, and there are a lot more wonderful sights in St. Petersburg, the guests of the city love coming to the river. And um, the reason why river views enjoying the river is so popular is because of the bridges that are across the river. And I'm going to show you um, one of the view with the bridges that will help you understand why our bridges are so famous. So here you can see one of the bridges across the Neva River. And as you can see, this is a drawbridge. So the bridges across the Neva River, um, they open at night so that trade ships can go through. And the view of the opening bridges is one of the landmarks of St. Petersburg, one of the most famous things about our city. Not only it just looks really beautiful, but it's also beautifully illuminated at night. Um, they play classical music. The city itself acts as a beautiful background um, to the opening of the bridges. And as you can see here um, in this particular view, um, the sky has also very magical color. And um, this is another re reason why looking at the bridges at night is so awesome. So this view was taken approximately uh, at 1 a.m. And probably towards the end of June, because that is when in St. Petersburg we have the period of white nights. And that is when it pretty much never gets dark. Uh, maybe it gets dark for like a couple hours a day. The rest of the night, the sky looks like this. It has this beautiful pinkish purplish color. And ha seeing the bridges open with this background is even more magical. Um, as I mentioned, you know, guests of the city even, you know, do their best to stay up till 1 a.m. to see this beautiful sight. Um, the bridges, they stay open from 1 a.m. to about 5 or 6 a.m. And for the locals, though, uh, seeing the bridges like this is just a big nuisance, <laughs> really, because as I said, they stay open between about you know, one and five, and say you live on in this part of the city across the river, and you went, it's summertime, you went and you decided to party in downtown, and you're partying here, all of a sudden you realize that it's like almost 1 a.m., you made it to the bridge, but you didn't make it on time, as you can see, these guys right here, they're all crowded up next to the bridge and they can't cross it because it's open. That happens to St. Petersburg locals all the time because in the summer we love to be out and about late at night, but then we have to be really mindful of the bridges. We even call the bridges the perfect St. Petersburg excuse. Like if we don't want to be home um, on time, we always like to blame it on the bridges. Anyway, um, if you are in St. Petersburg and you're stuck in downtown at night because of the bridges, uh, certainly you have um, lots to see. And most of the sites that I will be showing you today, they are located in downtown as well. And the first site that I want to show you is um, the site that most people who visit St. Petersburg tell me was their favorite building that they saw. So uh, here it is. This beautiful building is called the Church on Spilled Blood. I know it is quite a strange name for a beautiful church like this. Why is this called the Church on Spilled Blood? Well, there is a pretty tragic story behind it. Um, the blood of one of Russian czars was spilled um, on the place where uh, the church is built. So he was assassinated here. He was um, famous in Russian history as the Tsar the Liberator. His name was Alexander II. And what he did for our country is he freed um, the slaves, basically, the serfs 
um, that we had in our country. However, um, the terrorist groups uh, that existed in Russia at that time believed that it was too little too late. And even though he was probably the most liberal of all Russian czars, um, he was criticized for not being liberal enough. They were several terrorist groups that wanted to assassinate him. One of them succeeded. So one day he was going down the canal embankment right here in his carriage when a terrorist threw a bomb at him. And his carriage exploded. He died. And so his son decided to build a church on the place where um, his father was assassinated. Um, it was already late 19th century. At that time, Architecture in the Russian capital was heavily influenced by European architecture, which in turn was really influenced by ancient Greek and Roman architecture, which was really popular at that time. And if we have a look around, you can see that the majority of the buildings in the area um, look very similar to each other. Um, they have these pastel colors, some white details in there, um, and the czar who commissioned this church, the Church on Spill Blood, he wanted it to look different. He really wanted it to stand out. And he said he started a competition. A lot of people, architects, applied um, to build this church on Spill Blood. However, um, a lot of the projects, they looked like what you see around the church right now. There was one um, suggestion that came not from an architect, but from a priest. And this priest offered to inspire the design of the church on ancient Russian architecture. Um, and this is what ended up happening. You can see the beautiful details that really make this church stand out so much, like the onion-shaped domes um, decorated with bright enamel, the walls of the church that are decorated with mosaics. Um, uh, so all of that is inspired by ancient Russian architecture. Um, the church took 24 years to build. It took quite a while. And the big reason why it took so long was because the interior of the church um, was really complicated to decorate. So I'm going to take you inside the church and spill blood so you can enjoy its beautiful interior, which I believe is as gorgeous, if not more, um, than the outside. So we are now inside the church and spill blood and you can see beautiful, bright walls. And these walls, they are covered entirely with mosaics. On the columns of the church, you can see um, uh, depictions of uh, Russian Orthodox saints. On the walls, you can see scenes from uh, the Bible. And um, there is mosaic of all colors. It's beautiful. It's bright. And I think the color that really stands out the most is the gold, right? Because there's also a lot of light in the church. There are really large windows in here. And the gold just shines beautifully in the light. And these golden pieces of mosaic, they were made with real gold. They took this material that is called gold leaf. And, um, you know, if you're listening right now, um, just find a hair on your head. And gold leaf, this material that is used in the golden mosaics, um, is as thin as human hair. So this is how thin this layer of gold is. Um, and then this really thin layer, it's baked between two layers of glass and then broken into small pieces. And this is how mosaic, uh, the golden mosaic pieces are made. As I mentioned, uh, the church took 24 years to build. And the, uh, the whole project was completed in the early 20th century, um, in um, 1904. However, um, another big date that uh, you might know from Russian history that is in the early 20th century is 1917. So some of you might know that in 1917 in Russia, we had the revolution. So between 1904 and 1917, there's not a lot of time. 
During that time, the church functioned as a private church of the royal family. So not everybody could come in here, only the royal family themselves and their invited guests. However, after 1917, um, we had the revolution. So the royal family was overthrown. There was no more royal family. And Russia became the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union was an atheist country officially. So the two things that are at the core of this church, right, being a memorial for a Russian monarch and being a church, right, monarchy and religion, the two very important things about this building, they were absolutely um, negative in uh, the Soviet times. And um, in the Soviet Union, a lot of the former churches of the Russian Empire they got either destroyed or they got repurposed. So they would take a church and put a movie theater in there, or there was a church in St. Petersburg where they put a swimming pool um, and things like this, schools, clubs. Um, and this church during the Soviet times, it functioned as a storage. At first, uh, it functioned as a, um, as a theater decoration storage, but then during World War II, um, it became a vegetable storage. As you might know, during World War II, our city, which was then called Leningrad, it got um, besieged by the Nazis and people were starving in Leningrad. So they started growing some vegetables once it got warmer and uh, they would store them over here in this church. And the locals even called it the Church on Spilled Potatoes. And if you imagine a building being a warehouse or a storage uh, facility, of course, you can deduce that people were not really taking good care of it. You know, nobody was really taking care of the beautiful mosaics. A lot of really expensive parts of the decor, they were looted from the church. During the war, because of the bombings, the windows of the church, they broke and snow and rain would go into the uh, church. So by 1950s, the church was in terrible shape. And there was even a project to blow it up and construct a metro station here. But um, thanks to Russian bureaucracy, the project sort of got passed back and forth and it never happened. And eventually they decided to restore it. And you might remember, I said the construction of the church took 24 years, which was a long time, but the restoration took even longer. It took 27 years to finally restore. Um, and the restoration was completed in 1997. And since then, this has been a museum, not a functioning church. And it's been protected under the Russian Ministry of Culture. So um, the church is kept in really good shape and it's possible to visit. I want to go back outside and go back to the city bird's eye view to um, give you an idea of where the Church on Spilled Blood is located and what are the spots that we have already seen. So we were by this bridge right here. Uh, we saw it at night, we saw it open. And then, uh, then we went further to the Church on Spilled Blood, which as you can see is located on the shore of a canal, one of my city's many canals. And the canal crosses this big avenue. This avenue is the main street of St. Petersburg. It's called Nevsky Prospect. Prospect means avenue in Russian. Uh, Nevsky Prospect um, historically was originally the main street of St. Petersburg. So along the street, the richest families would build their residences. We would have the best churches, the best shops, um, the best little gardens. And um, so it's worth just taking a stroll down Nevsky Avenue so that you can enjoy the many beautiful facades of the buildings. But we obviously can't do that with you today. We have a lot to see. But I want to show you my favorite spot in Nevsky Avenue, which is right here. Uh, we were just on the shore of this canal with the Church of Spilled Blood. And my favorite part of the avenue is right here where the canal crosses Nevsky Avenue. So I'm going to take you there and explain to you why I like it so much. Here we are. Uh, we can see the Church on Spilled Blood further down the canal embankment. And uh, right here, 
is another gorgeous building. The reason I like this part of the avenue is because no matter what direction you look, you always see something beautiful. As I said, there is the Church of Spilled Blood right there. And right in front of you is another gorgeous building um, that was constructed, it was completed around the same time as the Church on Spilled Blood. It's constructed in this gorgeous Art Nouveau style. And it was built to be the store for Singer sewing machine. Singer company was incredibly popular in Russia at that time. And so they had a store and a factory here. Um, but again, uh, the Russian revolution of 1917 really changed the destiny of Singer in Russia. Um, as in the Soviet Union, businesses were government controlled. It did not work for the Singer company. So they left um, the country. The building was abandoned and eventually it became a bookstore. And the Singer building now is home to St. Petersburg's main bookstore that is called the House of Books. And the House of Books is a really popular meeting point for uh, the locals. So if you, we decide to go out and spend some time um, in the city center, which we love, um, St. St. Petersburg city center is not just for tourists, locals love going there. So if we go there, we love meeting up with our friends inside the house of books, because if your friend is late, you can always grab a book and read it. And we in St. Petersburg take great pride in the fact that we are all really well read. Um, we call St. Petersburg the cultural capital of Russia. Uh, it's not the capital anymore. St. Peters uh, Moscow is the capital now, but we say that we're the cultural capital. And uh, another great thing about the Singer building is that there is a little cafe on the second floor that I highly recommend uh, you to try if you are ever in St. Petersburg. So. We are now, as you can see, on the second floor of the Singer building. You can see the books um, on sale. And if we walk towards the window, you will get to see a tiny glimpse, a little teaser of the beautiful view that you can see from the windows here. And just further down that way is um, the cafe, Cafe Singer, uh, that I highly recommend uh, you go to and try to sit by the window. You can bring any book from the store. You don't have to buy it even to bring it into the cafe. And they have wonderful breakfasts, uh, great coffees, great teas, traditional Russian crepes, um, a really common breakfast there. So you can enjoy some crepes, some good coffee, a book, and a beautiful view, which I will reveal to you now. You look on the other side of the avenue, um, from the House of Books, you get to see this gorgeous church, the cathedral, in fact, known as Kazan Cathedral. And Kazan Cathedral um, was built here to commemorate Russia's victory over Napoleon in 1812. It also might remind some of you, uh, if you think, oh, I feel like I've seen this building before. <laughs> Well, it was uh, the design of the building was inspired by the St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. So the beautiful colonnade comes from there. And you can see a statue in front of the church. This is a statue of a Field Marshal Kutuzov, which he was the biggest, most important Field Marshal of the war with Napoleon. He liked this church so much, he visited it a fair amount, and he even got buried inside. It's really worth going inside this church because um, unlike the church on spilled blood, this one is a working church. So in here, you really get to experience what the service is like in a Russian Orthodox church um, because it's a little different from Catholic or Protestant churches. As we look around, the first thing that really just stands out is the fact that it's a large open space. There are no views in here. And that is because in Russian Orthodox Church, it's not allowed to sit during the service. We can only either stand or kneel um, during the service. And at the same time, you don't need to like stand in one place. You can walk around the church, enjoy its beautiful interiors. And really the religious experience for most people is just Connecting to the icon, 
that we like. So you can find the icon that you like, you light the candle in front of it and have your intimate moment with the icon. Of course, we do have church services. Normally, they're three times a day. They're about 15 minutes. But you can just come and go as you please inside the church. Some services, however, do last a long time and you do have to stand through them. Those would be the Christmas and the Easter services and they last all night. So some people do stand inside the church all night um, for these services. And you might have noticed that there are some people standing here already right now, though it's not, I'm sorry, uh, though it's not nighttime. And these people are all lining up we're over there. This is not for communion. This is to kiss an icon. There's an icon right here. So they are all lining up to kiss this icon that is called the icon of Our Lady of Kazan. It's believed to be a miraculous icon. So it brings health. It makes your deepest wishes come true. And people from all over the country come to Kazan Cathedral to try to have their intimate moment with this icon. So this is what the line is for can now go back outside and um, so this is Kazan Cathedral right here that we saw uh, the House of Books also known as the Singer Building the church on spilled blood further down um, and another part of um, Nevsky Avenue that I really like is the part where it connects with the main square of our city which is right here the main square of our city is called the Palace Square. And this is where I'm going to take you now. So we are now on Palace Square. Uh, in front of us is a beautiful monument that was also built to commemorate our victory of Napoleon. The monument is of an angel with a cross. Um, and it's, it is quite expressive. You can see the angel is pointing at a cross while stepping on a snake. So the angel is sort of like the guardian angel of our city. It protects our city and the snake symbolizes the enemy. So the angel is stepping on the enemy while pointing at the cross, sort of saying that um, God uh, is on our side and uh, that is going to protect the city against the enemies. The Monument of the Angel stands on top of a big column. This big column is made of a solid piece of granite. And an interesting fact about it is that nothing holds the column in its place. It stands here just by the power of gravity. <laughs> and uh, the fact that we don't have earthquakes in uh, St. Petersburg. So when the column was just put here, um, people were, of course, afraid of walking around it. They thought, what if it falls? Uh, but the architect who built the column, his name was Auguste Montferrand, really believed that it would never fall. So he made a point of walking his dog around the column every day to prove to the guests of the city um, and the locals that everything's going to be okay. And the column really has stood there in its place um, and it has never fallen. On the other side of the column, we can see um, this gorgeous palace. And the reason why um, the square is called the Palace Square, uh, it is the Winter Palace or the winter residence of the Russian royal family. Um, I mentioned Peter the Great earlier. And so the Winter Palace was constructed for his daughter, Elizabeth, who, unlike Peter, who was the original minimalist, he liked to live in small places, he liked to own really few things. Elizabeth, she loved luxury. So she asked her court architect to construct this a large, palace for her. The palace consisted of over a thousand rooms. And remember the church on spilled blood that was constructed in 24 years? Well, this palace was built in eight years. The reason is that at that time, our royal family had a lot of serfs and um, they were able to complete uh, the palace really quickly. So over a thousand rooms. But unfortunately, even though it was really quick, Empress Elizabeth never got to live in the palace. She died before it was completed. And instead, the person who first moved into the palace was her niece-in-law, the woman who married her nephew. 
And this is another name in Russian history that you might have heard of. Um, her name was Catherine the Great. Catherine the Great moved into this wing of the palace right here. And um, immediately, pretty much as soon as she moved in, she asked to build a little addition for her. Can you believe that? A little addition as right here. Um, and the reason why she wanted that addition was because uh, she wanted to store her art collection in there. So she, she was the first art collector in the Romanov family. So she placed her art collection in that building. And even though it was quite a collection, she didn't like to show it to a lot of people. She normally either spent time in the collection on her own or with her really close friends. And she used to say, only mice and me can enjoy my art collection. And because she spent a lot of time in that building alone, like a hermit, um, she called it my hermitage. And this little building gave the name and was the birthplace of one of the best art galleries in the world, which is the Hermitage Museum. Uh, so this is where the Hermitage Museum really started. And then a hundred years after um, this, uh, the art collection of the Romanovs was already so large that it didn't fit in the little building here. And it was moved um, to the new building that was constructed back then. You can see this yellow building with a green roof. Um, that is, was called the New Hermitage. And um, all the three buildings, the Winter Palace, the Small Hermitage, as we call it now, and the New Hermitage, they formed the complex of the Hermitage Museum. It all became a museum available to the public after the 1917 revolution. And I do have a separate tour of just the Hermitage Museum, but of course, I'm going to bring you inside and show you one of the interiors of the many, many interiors at the Hermitage. The interior that I want to show you is the first interior that the guests of the royal family would see when they visited the royal family. That would be the main staircase. And this is also the only interior that remained in the Hermitage from the time of that Empress Elizabeth, that opulent Zarina that loved luxury so much. Uh, the next generations um, after. Elizabeth, they did not like this really flashy Baroque style. They thought it was a bit too much, but they believed that for the main staircase, it was really appropriate because as this would be the first interior that the guests see when they visit the royal family, um, they would really feel like, oh, Russia is doing really well. Russia is really well off. They have so much money. On the uh, gilded wood carvings on the wall, um, you can see um, gold leaf, again, the same material I told you about earlier. And of course, this material, as you can imagine, is very fragile. So at the Hermitage, they have to constantly restore it. And um, uh, because it's also tempting, you know, people try to touch it as well. Another interesting material used in the decor of the church, uh, sorry, decor of the palace, um, is marble, and you can see this gorgeous marble railing uh, that is made of Carrara marble. It comes from a region in Italy called Carrara. And in Carrara, they believe that they have the whitest marble in the world. So here at the Hermitage, you can also uh, see the whitest marble in the world. And as we go further up, uh, we can see even more splendor. The large windows that you can see here they give the view of the Neva River, the beautiful main river of our city. You can see uh, the window, the mirrors on the wall that are placed symmetrically to the windows um, to create an impression of a larger size and to give more light uh, to the interior. You can see gorgeous granite columns on your left. And if you look up, further up, you can see uh, the beautiful ceiling painting that is called gods of olympus um, and the reason this painting was put here it was to show respect to the guests of the royal family as when uh the gods of olympus heard that the royal family would have such important guests they all gathered in the sky above the winter palace to greet the guests of the royal family so this is what they're doing here so in a way we are guests of the royal family too and they are greeting us um, and we just saw again the main staircase of the Winter Palace. We're gonna go outside, back outside. Um, 
and look around some more. Uh, there are a lot of other gorgeous interiors that we can see. For example, uh, the building with a gilded spire um, is called the Admiralty, and this is the shipbuilding yard. Um, originally, when St. Petersburg was just founded and Russian Navy as a thing was born, some of the very first ships of that fleet, they were built in the Admiralty and launched from there. Today, this building is a naval school for boys. Um, and behind it is a beautiful cathedral with a gilded dome. I'm going to come a little closer to it. It's called St. Isaac Cathedral. And uh, St. Isaac's Cathedral is truly huge. It is the fourth largest dome cathedral in the world. After St. Peter's in Rome, St. Paul's in London, and Santa Maria del Fiore in Florence. St. Isaac's Cathedral was built in the middle of the 19th century. And at that time, St. Petersburg was um, a really important city, not just in Russia, it was the capital of Russia, it was a really important city in Europe in general. And a lot of people were moving to St. Petersburg from all over Europe. The city was rapidly growing and uh, they needed a big church um, that could fit a lot of people at the same time. So they constructed this church uh, so that it could fit 6,000 people at the same time. And the construction of this church, get that, took 40, 40 years uh, compared to the 24 and the 8 uh, that we just heard. Lots of um, innovative technologies uh, were used um, here for the decor of the church, like the beautiful granite columns, for example, um, the um, way that the columns were put in their spots uh, was really innovative. Um, they wrapped them in ropes and then people were pulling special turning mechanisms that would help to put the columns in their uh, places. Um, I'm going to bring you inside the church as well uh, so that you can experience the beautiful interior, the beautiful open space that was created to fit 6,000 people at the same time. Uh, here we are. All right, so this is... Uh, the wall that we are looking at um, this wall is a really important part of every russian orthodox church uh, this wall is called the iconostasis or the icon wall and uh, this wall the purpose of the wall is to separate the altar uh, from the main part of the church where the congregation is standing so we are now in the main part of the church where the congregation is and behind the wall uh, right now is the altar Normally, in the center of this iconostasis wall, there is a door, which we call the holy door. And when there is no service going on, the door is normally closed. So if you are just visiting it as a, um, in a, as a church, you might never be able to see what the altar looks like. But because uh, St. Isaac's Cathedral is a museum, same as the church on still blood, they have the holy door always open, and we get to have a peek at the altar, what the altar looks like. So um, here it is, there's the altar right there. And behind the altar, you can see this beautiful um, stained glass uh, depiction of Jesus Christ, which is really unusual for a Russian Orthodox church. Stained glass and the art of stained glass is something that Russians lost many, many centuries ago um, when we were invaded by Chinggis Khan and Mongols. Um, after that, the art of stained glass just never revived for some reason. However, as you might know, stained glass is incredibly popular in Europe and in France especially. And the architect uh, who built uh, St. Isaac's Cathedral was French. It's, his name was Auguste Montferrand, and he's the same architect who put up that column I told you about, that it's just a solid piece of granite and nothing holds it in its place but gravity. August Montferrand came to Russia when he was a young man, uh, he was only 18, and at that time, the Tsar of Russia, whose name was Nicholas I, he announced the competition um, of the project for the new St. Isaac's Cathedral. Montferrand was really young, uh, but 
his project ended up winning and that is because number one he was really good at drawing he provided really beautiful pictures of what the church would look like and the czar really liked it number two he was really willing to make concessions and do the things that the emperor wanted him to do for example there used to be a church on the spot and um the czar wanted the new architect to keep the old altar wall of the old church in the spot um and monferran said yes the thing is it, he ended up having to destroy the old altar wall it didn't work out because the new church would be that much larger right um but uh, still you know the project he ended up working on the project and it took 40 years of his life as i mentioned it took 40 years to build the church i apologize i'm not sure what is coming up on my screen right now i'm going to close that i'm not sure what is happening that has never happened before <laughs> How do I close this? Oh, there we go. Okay, uh, I'm just going to reopen this view again and give you a chance to walk around, um, to have a look around the church interior. So on the other side where we have the iconostasis here, we can see a beautiful open space with imported marble, granite, other semi-precious uh, semi stones, and a beautifully painted ceiling with depictions of saints and at the very top we can see a beautiful sculpture of a dove uh, that symbolizes the holy spirit um one last slide that i want to show you today uh, is a church but not just the church it's a fortress with a church in it so let me bring you there we are now standing on the territory of a fortress. And this is called Peter and Paul's Fortress. Peter and Paul's Fortress is the first structure uh, that was built in St. Petersburg, back when we had the, that war with Sweden. Um, and there was basically a little town within the fortress walls. People lived here and they needed a place to go and pray. So this gorgeous church was constructed. It's called Peter and Paul's Cathedral. And it's significant for many reasons. Number one, as I said, it's the oldest church in St. Petersburg. Number two, it's a really important part of St. Petersburg skyline with the gorgeous spire going up in the air. Um, and the, it can be seen from many different parts of the city. Finally, another really important thing about this church is that it's the burial place of the Russian royal family. Um, I'm going to bring you inside and show you the interior of the cathedral as well as some burial places and um, the tombs of the Russian royal family. So you can see uh, that this church is decorated really differently uh, from the other churches that we saw today. Uh, it has like beautiful columns that look like they are made of marble, but, but they aren't. Uh, they are painted to imitate uh, marble right here, because when this church was constructed, there were no workshops, no factories on the territory of St. Petersburg, so they had to be really clever with um, really resourceful uh, with finding materials. Same happens with the iconostasis here. In other churches, those were really solid, big walls. But then here, the iconostasis is made of wood. It was actually made of wood in Moscow and shipped to St. Petersburg where it was put together as like one giant Lego and covered with a thin layer of gold, gold leaf right here. Um, finally, let me show you some burial places. So in here, these are the tombs of uh, some uh, Russian czars and tsarinas. With a bust right here, this is the tomb of Peter the Great, the founder of our city. He is buried next to his wife, Catherine I, and their daughter, Elizabeth. She's the one that founded uh, the Winter Palace and, in a way, the Hermitage Museum. Our wonderful Catherine the Great is buried right behind them, next to her uh, husband, Peter III. So these were the oldest tombs in the cathedral. And in the other part of the cathedral are the newest tombs. In this part of the church, uh, we can see um, the tombs of the last Russian czars. Now you might have heard something about the last Russian czars. For example, you maybe have heard Princess Anastasia 
maybe you watched the show the last Tsars on netflix um which is quite interesting and so the last russian Tsars they were overthrown as a result of the russian revolution um they were placed under house arrest and um uh, they were kind of moved around the country for a while, but then eventually they were executed by the Bolshevik soldiers. And um, uh, they, the worst thing is that they never got a proper burial. They were not buried anywhere. The bodies were just thrown in the coal mines. And for a long time, nobody really knew where the bodies were. And that um, really was the origin of a lot of conspiracy because for a while, People didn't see the bodies, so they believed that maybe the royal family survived. Maybe some of the members of the royal family survived. You might have heard the story of Princess Anastasia um, that survived. Uh, but in the very end of the 20th century, the bodies were finally discovered. And in the 90s, DNA tests were held. And so it was proven that the bodies were that were discovered were really the bodies of the last Russian royal family. And they were buried here in this cathedral. Um, so Anastasia didn't survive, neither did any other members of the close um, last royal family. They're all buried here. Uh, they are buried underground. There's one sarcophagus that stands for the whole family. And on the wall, all um, so, uh, for different members of the last royal family. So this is the last slide uh, that I wanted to show you today. I'm still happy to answer any questions if you have any. So uh, Brittany, I'm um, not sure how questions are handled. Um, uh, can people type them under the Facebook Live? Y yes, any questions that you may have for Olga? Um, this was great. Um, you know, I did have a couple comments on Facebook that said, wow, <laughs> this is so exciting. You know, um, I think everybody like me is just happy to be tuning in and being able um, to just travel right from our living rooms. Oh, that's so, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if anyone has any questions for Olga, uh, please put them in the comments on Facebook, or you could please chat in the... Uh, chat section if you are joining us through Zoom. Oh, awesome. Yes. And while people are typing, um, while people are typing, I can quickly share. If you are interested, I, I do have more tours and I constantly publish a lot more content about Russia. So um, I have an email newsletter uh, that you're welcome to sign up for. I'm going to really quickly show you oops, um, how what the page looks like to sign up, and then I'll share the link in the chat. So this is the sign up page. Um, you can put your email address here, first and last name here, and click subscribe. First of all, you'll immediately get a free tour recording, which is a tour of St. Petersburg, but through the lens of Soviet history. So it's all other sites from what we just saw with you today. And then every Monday, you will be getting my email newsletter um which has lots of um great free content uh that i put up so i'm gonna share this link in the chat and since a lot of you are watching on facebook i also have a facebook group that is really easy if you can see my name is olga cardamon so the group is called russia with olga cardamon um so you can find um my group on facebook as well i would love to see you there too and um see you reading my newsletter too that would be great. Well, thank that. you. Thank you again for joining us tonight. This has been awesome. And we do look to have you back for other tours. I would love that. I would love that, Brittany. Great. Awesome.